All right, so we now have come to the last section of this lecture. There are many different methods for estimating causal effects, and many of these fall outside the scope of an introduction to causal inference. In this section, I'll give you a little bit of information about some of the other methods, and you can find pointers to more information about them in the course book. The first is that we saw modeling of the outcome mu in COM estimation, and we saw modeling of the propensity score in IPW estimation, but neither COM estimation nor IPW estimation modeled both of these. But of course there are estimators that model both the conditional outcome model and the propensity score, and then use that for estimation. So to see a natural example of such an estimator that uses both of these, first consider a COM estimation. And then from the propensity score theorem, we know that conditioning on W is just as good as conditioning on the propensity score. So we can get an estimator that uses both the conditional outcome model and the propensity score model by just plugging in the propensity score for W here. One special class of methods that models both the conditional outcome model and the propensity score model is known as doubly robust methods. One important property of doubly robust methods is that they are consistent if either the conditional outcome model or the propensity score model is consistent. And you can think of consistent here as meaning that given infinite data, our model will be correct. So given infinite data, mu hat will match mu and e hat will match e. Another property of doubly robust methods that is really cool is that they will theoretically converge to the estimand at a faster rate than COM or IPW estimation. You might interpret this as that W robust methods are more efficient with data, but these theoretical results are usually in the asymptotic regime where we have infinite data. So really for finite samples, it's a bit unclear. You can check out section 7.7 .7 of the course book for references to relevant papers. The next other popular method is known as matching. In matching, we take individuals in the treatment group and match them to similar individuals in the control group, where they're similar in the sense that they have roughly the same covariance, at least the covariance that we need to adjust for. So here, this blue dot can match to this red one, and same with these other three. And then these three treated individuals don't get matched to anyone. So the ones that are not matched, same in the control group, there's many more individuals who are not matched in the control group. The individuals that are not matched are just thrown out of the analysis. And then we only consider the ones that are matched. This is because we need to find a close enough match in order to say that we've adjusted properly. So if we can't find a close match, then we just got to throw it out. And there's a large literature on matching. So for example, we can do this matching in the raw covariate space. We can do it in the coarsened version of the covariate space, or we can even do it in propensity score space. Each of those is a different kind of matching. And there's different criteria for what means close enough. So each of these ones with lines between them were deemed close enough. That's why they were matched. And then this blue was not deemed close enough to this red, for example. So that's why those two were not matched. Another popular method is double machine learning, right? So machine learning is really cool. But then if you have double machine learning, it's, you know, it's maybe twice as cool. And the name might have something to do with the fact that there's two stages to double machine learning. So in the first stage, we do two things. The first, we fit a model to predict y from w to get the predicted y hat. We also fit a model to predict t from w to get the predicted t hat. And that's stage one. Then in stage two, we use this y hat and this t hat. So using those, we can partial out w by fitting a model pred to predict y 
minus y hat from t minus t hat. So the idea here is that by subtracting these values that were fitted to w, so that's the y hat, and then t hat was fitted to w, by subtracting those out, it's like we're subtracting out w, we're parceling out w, and that is how we remove the confounding that w introduces into the observational data. And this is double machine learning in the sense that we use machine learning a first time in stage one, and then on top of the models that we get from stage one, that's y hat and t hat, then we fit another machine learning model on top of those to predict these residuals. And the last other methods that we'll consider are causal trees and causal forests. So you can think of causal trees in as, as an extension of decision trees to estimate causal effects. And here's just an example of a decision tree. It's just like a flow chart. And then a forest is just a bunch of trees together. Decision trees and forests are flexible, but then more importantly, they yield valid confidence intervals. So everything we've seen so far, we estimate a point, a point estimate for the ATE or for the CATE. But there's some uncertainty there because we only have finite data. You could imagine putting intervals around that point to convey that if we had gotten a different sampling of the data, the points might fall somewhere else. And, you know, it could be that they mostly fall in that interval. And this interval is supposed to encompass sampling variability. It's not supposed to encompass things like what would happen if we had unobserved confounding, which is what we'll see next week. And we're lucky enough to have Susan Athey, one of the researchers who developed these methods, give a guest talk in this course on causal trees and causal forests. And that will be the next talk in the course. If you want to get notifications for that talk or any upcoming lectures, then go ahead and subscribe below and hit the bell icon next to it. And with that, we'll conclude this lecture. See you in the next one.